happy to be here. And I would love to come and visit. I would like to come and join me. And the closest I've ever been to your part of the world is back in 1975. I was in the United States Navy and I made it to Singapore. Oh, that's as close as I've gotten, but I would love to go because I know there's been many, many changes in your part of the world and in every other part of the world as well. Um, but let me, uh, let me start with the uh, presentation. Uh, that's what you're all here for. And I'm going to share my screen. And I am not going to be watching the chat. Um, uh, I, we will have several times during this presentation for me to take your questions um, that you put in the chat or in the question area. I'm not sure what, what uh, functionality you're using here. But, uh, but we'll do that. So I, I'm going to go through this uh, uh, and try to go slow. I'm normally a very fast talker. And my joke is, before I start a lot of presentations, is that I hope you've had the prerequisite of speed listening because I'm a fairly fast talker. So I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. Yeah, don't worry about the questions. I'm going to compile all the questions for you. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, so this is about performance improvement, and it's beyond but including instruction. So I've been in the instructional systems design, ISD business, since 1979. And when I first got out of college with my radio TV film degree, I joined a training organization at Wix Lumber at their headquarters in Saginaw, Michigan. I had two and a half years at the of my college time working for them in a lumber center. And so these uh, so, sold all sorts of hardware and lumber products to consumers in the college town where I was at. Um, and because I was getting this radio TV film degree and at headquarters, they were just about ready to switch over from 35 millimeter slides with audio tracks as their delivery mechanism to their 183 lumber centers across North America, the US and Canada. And I was getting this radio TV film degree and they were gonna to convert to video. Uh, three of the managers that I'd worked for in two and a half years told the vice president of human resources that they should hire me. Um, and so that's how I got the job. And I've been very lucky since that time in that I was oriented to a performance approach, a performance orientation to training or instruction, nowadays learning and development or learning experience design um, since the very beginning. And my key mentor, the late Gary Rumler, um, was influential with me. I got to work with him when I was at Motorola uh, back in 81 and 82. But in 79 and 80 and 81, I worked at Wix in a 10-person training department that happened to have this Gary Rumler's brother-in-law working there. And the two people that I worked closest with had worked with Gary Rumler's brother at an insurance company in Detroit, Michigan. And so I was inundated, oriented, trained with this particular performance approach. And it, I was told when I was being taught this initially that this was a derivative of a derivative of a Gary Rumler approach to instructional design, ID. Now, I prefer the term ISD, Instructional Systems Design, because I think that that's a broader look at training and development. It looks at the entire system of instruction, not just one course or module at a time, but it looks like everything. So that's what a path is nowadays called a, the learning journey. Um, but so there's many, been many language changes over the decades that I've been in this business. And you're going to have to contend with that as students in this, and that some of the things that you read from the past are to use a slightly different set of language labels for a lot of these things. I've been writing and presenting on all of this since the early 80s. And so I tend to use a little bit old school language, trying to be consistent with what I've written so that people who look at what I write today 
and what I look what I wrote in the 1980s, it's pretty much the same language because I don't want to be changing the language just because that's more current. That causes issues though for people who are reading current authors and then they look at some of my things and it looks rather old school. Uh, that's just uh, how that goes, I guess. All right, so I'm going to walk you through a big picture view of performance, what I call my EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. It's where the name of my company comes from. This is my model for what's sometimes known as HPT, Human Performance Technology, which is also known as HPI, Human Performance Improvement. And I take a very expansive look at performance improvement, very much like I think the total quality management movement, which I also got exposed to in the early 80s when I was working at Motorola. So, and for the, just as an aside, the whole notion of Six Sigma, when Motorola created Six Sigma, they licensed the intellectual property of this Gary Rumler, who was my key mentor when they created Six Sigma. So there's an overlap between how I look at things and what the total quality management movement does with Lean and Six Sigma. These are other improvement methods that usually come out of engineering disciplines and not instructional design. So those two things evolved separately, but kind of came together in the 80s, uh, although not many people would look at that. So this graphic on the left, we're gonna look at a larger uh, view of this in just a moment, but this is my attempt to break performance down into three major segments, the process, the environmental asset enablers, and the human asset enablers. Now, some people would quibble with my use of the term assets because people aren't assets, but um, and that's been a dialogue, a debate for decades, quite frankly. Um, and so this is some of my old school language. This graphic was first created in 2002 and it was updated in 2011. So it's a little bit old school. Uh, I have a saying that adopt what you can, adapt the rest. So when I share with these models and these, this language with you, you need to feel free to change it to fit the context that you're working in. I've been doing that my entire career, so you should too. So don't let my current language uh, inhibit you. Feel free to change it and adapt my language and my diagrams, my graphics to fit your needs. Um, that's always appropriate. So there's a second page, if you will, for this big picture, and we're gonna cover all of this too. It's a way to document performance through process maps performance models. I use the performance model approach, uh, but there's also this uh, swim lane uh, process maps. We'll look at that in a little bit. Then there's stakeholders. We're working for stakeholders and we're governed by their requirements. When we do tasks to produce outputs, we have to meet the needs, the requirements of many stakeholders. So we'll take a look at that. Once we've identified gaps from in the performance from what the stakeholders require, we have to go find the source for those gaps and make fixes. Sometimes we need to make a fix by creating training or instruction or learning. And sometimes it's got nothing to do with a deficit of knowledge and skills of the performers. And there may be other things that need to be addressed. This is one of the key things that I learned from the late Gary Rumler indirectly in 79 and 80 and 81, but then directly when I got a chance to work with him on, on uh, more than a dozen projects at Motorola in 81 and 82. Okay, so I've got this slide in here with a bunch about me. And so I put this in here so I could show you, this is how you deal with this. You say, you can read this later if necessary, but that's as much as time as I'm gonna spend on. All right, so I've been in the business for a long time and I've had a lot of projects and a lot of experience and I have my view of how to do this, but there are many competing views, very similar, I think, for the most part, from other people. And so you need to look and learn from lots of different people to create your own set of methods, unless the companies that you go work for have process have practices, have an infrastructure with tools and software and such 
to help you do your job. But if they don't, and you have to create one, you need to borrow from the best. And there's many different versions out here similar to mine. So just keep that in mind. So we're talking about the big picture of the enterprise process performance improvement. I take a process orientation to performance. And so that's kind of my anchor to look at the processes. We're going to do that. Then I'm going to entertain any questions you have and either answer them or defer them because I'm going to get to the answer later on in the formal presentation. So then we'll do a deeper dive into the process itself, the environment, and the human aspects of performance, the three major um, uh, vari sets of variables, if you will. Then we'll answer any more questions that you might have, or I'll defer them because I'm gonna get to them later in the final portion of the presentation. And that is once we've identified gaps in either the process or the environment or the human beings, then what do we do about that? Where do we go? How do we go make fixes for this? And I'll show you my model that you'll probably need to adapt rather than just simply adopt. And you can use this as a way to navigate in the assignments that you have in the companies and enterprises that you might work for in the future when you're no longer students. And we'll wrap it up with the final Q&A session and close. And I've got some free references um, on my website that I will point you to um, that uh, hopefully will be of some help and we'll go a little bit deeper in some of this. I have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resources on my website for free but uh, it would be quite a chore to figure out uh, what should you, where should you start, and what you should go to next. All right. So this is side one of my two page big picture of EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. This is for ISD or LXD practitioners. So the language is changing from instructional systems design, which quite frankly, when I started in the business in 1979, ISD stood for Instructional Systems Development, and, but it was changed in the early 80s to design. Uh, and now we're calling this learning experience design. And that's fine. That's the newer language. Um, but, but so this is, comes at this for people who are in the training and development business or the learning and development business for them to basically take a look at how to make sure that their instruction, their learning products really focus on and improve performance of the processes. So again, this is the three pictures here. There's the process itself. Now, the process must be designed to meet all stakeholder requirements. And this box over here says, what is required depends on the balanced performance requirements of all the stakeholders. Sometimes the customer wants you to do one thing, but the regulatory agencies say no. So there's a conflict in the requirements. And so that has to sometimes be balanced out. So that's one of the aspects of looking at the process itself is that does it meet the stakeholder requirements? Are there conflicts in those stakeholder requirements? If there are conflicts, which requirement wins out? In my example, do the regulators win or do the customers win? And since the regulators come from government, with the power to fine companies and throw people in jail, they probably win and customers don't get what they want if it violates the laws, the regulations and codes. So that's just one aspect of looking at the process. Now over here on the left of this, it says enterprise, function and department. And much like an organization chart, you can take an enterprise and break it up into the various functions. There could be a human resources function. There could be a marketing function. There could be a manufacturing or merchandising function or a sales function. It's a financial organization, a function. So there's many, the organization is usually organized into these functions. Now, there may be different language for the term function. So you'll need to determine that. But each function, such as human resources, might break down into various departments. There could be a compensation department. There could be a recruiting and selection department, it could be a training and development department, et cetera, et cetera. So when you are looking at 
an enterprise or an organization or a job, it exists within this system that's called an enterprise, which itself exists within a, a larger system, the world at large, the country, the, the, the geography, et cetera, uh, the industry. So there's, there's ways to get this down, but when you're looking at people and you're trying to develop training for them, you're trying to develop training for them so that they can perform adequately in a process, performing tasks to produce outputs to meet those stakeholder requirements. That's what processes are. If there's just people, there could be robot, robots involved in it. There could be all sorts of tools and computer software tools that people are using to do the work. And so that's what the process is all about. The second part that I look at is the environment. So if we have a process that's on paper and we need to put it in place, what are the things environmentally, the environmental assets that we need to make sure it is put in place or is adequate to the needs, the demands of the process? There's data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds. There's budget and headcount so that we can hire people and, and temporary staff if necessary. And the environment also provides a culture with a set of consequences for appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. Um, and this is really critical to looking at seeing, besides the humans, if you have the process and the environment in place, then what do the humans need to bring to the process. And so that's the third part of this is to look at, do they have the awareness, knowledge, and skills that are required? Do they have the physical attributes? Do they, you know, do they have to have physical strength? Do they have to have excellent eyesight or can they be blind? Do they have to have excellent hearing or could they be deaf? What does the process require of these humans from a physical attributes? Do they have to have certain strengths so they can lift heavy bags all day long and load them in the vehicle, in the trucks? So, so what does the process require of the humans from besides awareness, knowledge, and skills? What physical attributes do they need to have? And then there's also psychological attributes. If you were in sales and it took 20 on average 27 sales calls to make a sale, that means you're going to get 26 rejections before you get a sale. Is the person that you've got in place psychologically appropriate for that kind of rejection? Some people cannot do that and, and sustain themselves and go 27 on average. And what if they have to go 54 before they get a sale? Um, because an average is an average. So there's psychological attributes that we can look at. There's intellectual attributes. Do we need people to be conceptual thinkers, strategic thinkers, or do we need them to be concrete thinkers and tactical thinkers? Or do we need in the job, the person to be able to do both? So these are requirements here that are more affected by recruiting and selecting people than training and developing them. If I'm not a conceptual thinker, you may be able to get me to become one through your training and development, but most likely not. You might get lucky and it might happen, but for most people, you're not going to change basic attributes of people. Um, if I cannot hear very well, you're not going to be able, now you may be able to augment that with all sorts of technology. And so that's what then the, the environment would need to provide to improve my hearing. There's also values that human beings bring to certain jobs. So in some jobs, if you're dealing with customer, you have to have a customer, a value of customer orientation. Uh, trying to make customers satisfied. Um, if you're dealing with a very diverse set of customers, you have to appreciate diversity. And so we cannot allow people's values uh, if, if they're a mismatch for what the process requires. So this is the big picture of this. Now I'm going to go to page two, but these are the three key variable sets of enablers of process performance. It's the process itself. Has it been designed? Is there one? And if not, well then, if there is a process and nobody's adhering to it, nobody's following it, well, that could be an issue. And then do I have the right environment in place and the right humans in place to meet the needs of the process? 
All right, so on the second side of this, if you will, um, there's the first part here is we can define what the process requires. We can capture that data and report it out in a, using a couple of views. There's a process map view and a performance model view. And I'm gonna be focused on the performance model view because that's the one that I always use. But sometimes when I'm working with customers, I find that they have a process map view already. And so I need to be able to use that and not create a redundant set of content um, with my performance model view, unless my customer sees value in doing that because it contains different information and portrays that information in a different manner. So process and product metrics are established by the stakeholders. So the second thing we could look at is what, who are the stakeholders in general and, and for a particular project, what are they specifically? What government agencies are involved? Uh, are the shareholders and owners, do they have requirements, et cetera? So we're gonna look at this graphic in a larger size in a few minutes, but this is how we begin to determine what are the requirements for performers by understanding what's the process performance, who are the stakeholders, and what do those stakeholders require? And once we understand the requirements, then we can begin to identify any gaps where we're not meeting those requirements. So that's where a gap analysis comes into play when we don't meet stakeholder requirements. Then we'll look at, at the end of this presentation, so who owns the gap? When we find a gap, we have to figure out who should resolve that gap. Training cannot fix gaps if materials and equipment are inadequate. Somebody else in the organization probably owns the, the job of provisioning the right equipment and tools or data and information, et cetera, to the process. So when we're helping our clients determine that, well, training may be a part of the solution, but it's not the only solution, you may have to fix tools, you may have to fix materials. So we have to help our clients determine that and help them understand what are the gaps, what's the cause of those gaps, and if the fixes, the solutions lie elsewhere, we need to help our clients see that so they can work with those other providers because maybe we're only providing training and development content. We're not providing materials and tools, et cetera. So we work with our clients to help them solve their needs. And that's what we are attempting to do. All right. A few more slides here before we get to the questions and answers. So there's three sets of variables. There's the process itself. This is my adaptation of what was, what was known from the quality world as the Ishikawa diagram, sometimes called the fishbone diagram, sometimes called the cause and effect diagram. This was from Professor Ishikawa of Japan and created in, I believe, 1952. So this is as old as I am. Um, <clears throat> this is my adaptation of that. His original model that I saw at Motorola in 81 said the process was comp composed of four different sets of variables, men, methods, machines, and materials. Well, I changed those four Ms into what you see on the right here, human assets and the environmental assets, which was kind of a blend of the late Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. And you may come across this in some of your uh, educational programs, but Tom Gilbert was a business partner of my mentor, Gary Rumler, back in the 70s. And he wrote a book in 1978 titled Human Competence. And his he had in that a tool that helped with diagnosing performance problems. And I merged and melded his model with the Ishikawa diagram to create mine. So there's two sources for my adaptation, if you will. So I didn't adopt what I learned from, I adapted it and merged it. And again, you may find you need to do that as well. So when we look at a process, there's really a flow from one process to another. And the blue arrows there with it says O slash I, that stands for output, which is really an input. 
when one process produces an output, a deliverable, it becomes an input elsewhere. And so that's one of the orientations that we need to be when we're looking at doing training, we're training people to produce outputs, which are inputs downstream somewhere. And so what's important about that output is what did the customer downstream need? And these other stakeholders, again, we'll come to all that. So it could be, we could be looking at one single process or a bundle of processes in any particular assignment in a training and development project. You might be looking at what the organization looks at as, as many different processes. Now, processes are also difficult to figure out because most processes and organizations are informal. Some are named, some are measured, and some are managed. But the vast majority, in my experience, of processes are unnamed, unmeasured, and unmanaged. And so when we go looking, we get an assignment, we go looking at things, and some people say, well, that's the Wednesday process, and other people say, that's the Thursday process, and, but they mean the same thing. And that's one of the difficulties for us trying to figure out what's the process that people are working in, and because it's they're informal and they're not formally recognize the people that work in these processes, call them one thing, and other people in the organization may have a different name for it. And it just makes it very difficult, but that's part of our challenge when we're doing analysis is to figure out what's our focus. Is it a process? Is it a multitude of processes? And what do people call these things? And we may find as we investigate that, that it has different names. Again, it's just part of the difficulties of doing this. Then once we understand the process, we're focused on that and excluding other processes that we're not supposed to be focused on, we can begin to systematically derive what are the enablers. If we have a process and we understand it, what are the data and information requirements of that process? What are the materials and supplies? What tools and equipment does the process require? What facilities and grounds do we need a clean room because we're making microchips? Do we need a, a, a roof over our heads or do we need an open environment outdoors? Some processes require some things and other processes require others. And sometimes a process, it doesn't matter. It could be done outdoors, indoors, it doesn't really matter. So that's one of the things we have to figure out. Are, are there requirements for facilities and grounds? Does the facility have to have a certain level of electricity in it? Does it have to have running hot water in it? Does it have to have Bunsen burners for labs. So there's all these different kinds of facilities. So we have to have gas lines to run to the Bunsen burner. Uh, and those are part of the facilities. So that's what we need to figure out when we're looking at a process, if there's gaps, are any of these the causes? Does the organization, the department that owns the process, do they have the budget? Can they maintain it? You know, what are their requirements for financial resources and headcount? Are there season variabilities? You know, here in the United States in winter, we sell snow shovels. We don't sell them in the summertime. So when, when should producers of snow shovels really produce a lot of snow shovels? Well, getting ready for winter. But in the middle of winter, you don't need to make any more because soon spring will come and we don't need them anymore. So there's a variability, a seasonal variability, a demand variability for the process and we need to understand that. Does the department have enough people or are we working overtime or we're burning people out because we don't have budget for headcount uh, for additional temp workers, et cetera? And then there's the culture and consequences. Then we move to, so what do the humans need? Now, so one of the things the late Gary Rummler told taught me and many others is that we look at the process first and then we don't say, oh, we found a gap in the process. Let's blame the humans. Let's look at them and fix them. He said, no, look at them last. So that's why I'm going around this looking at the environmental assets before I look at the humans. He would say, let's give the humans a break. It's probably not their fault. And the late quality expert, uh, W. Edwards Deming, said similar things. It's not the individual performers that are the cause of gaps. It's the system. And to me, the system is the process and the environment. 
Um, but if we're going to look at the humans, we can determine, so what awareness, knowledge, and skills do they need? And do they have them? What physical attributes, what psychological attributes, what intellectual attributes, and what personal values are important? What does the process demand? What does the process require? And if we understand those requirements, we can determine if there are gaps in the environment or gaps in the humans that we have. And if there's a gap in the awareness, knowledge, and skills, we can fix that with training. But if there's a gap in the psychological attributes, we most likely cannot fix that with training. We may need to go and change the recruiting and selection system to do a better job of selecting people who are more conducive to what the process requires. Okay. What questions, comments, or concerns might you have before we go a little bit deeper into these three sets of variables? Okay, any questions? Uh, feel free to ask in Bahasa. Silakan bertanya dalam Bahasa Indonesia. Atau, uh, or you can ask your questions in English. You can open your mic and ask questions. Before, of course, Mr. Wallace continues. Well, I'm not seeing any pop up. Should I move on? I guess so. Either they are too shy to ask questions, or maybe they don't have questions yet. So yeah, maybe maybe I'm not making any sense, and so that's they're just confused. But that's okay. It's okay to not have any questions at this point. Hopefully, you'll have some by the end of the session. Um, but this is maybe new to you, so maybe you want to just take more of it in before we continue. All right. So let's see. All right, so we're, we're looking at the process. I'm going back now. We're gonna recover some of the ground that we just covered. We're making three passes at this, unfortunately. And so what's important, as I said earlier, was that processes produce outputs, which are inputs downstream. And that's really critical when we are doing our analysis for training purposes or for other purposes, I take a process performance orientation. I want to understand the process. Before. I don't want to ask, you know, what do they need to know? I want to know, what do people need to do? What do they need to produce? Then we'll figure out what they need to know. But I don't want to ask, start off with the client saying, well, what do people need to know? Because unfortunately, they'll tell you. And they'll tell you all sorts of things that probably aren't really necessary for a new person learning a new job task. So. There's this notion of upstream and downstream when we're talking about processes. Nowadays, some of the language is workflow. That's the new language that's kind of displacing process. Some people will talk about it both ways and you've got to be careful about that. But, but so when you're thinking about processes, for example, when you do analysis for training purposes, well, then you produce analysis data and then that goes into design. So the output of analysis is an input to the design process. And if you do formal designs, well, that's an output that becomes an input to development. And so we use it, we use these same kinds of thinking when we use an ADDI model, the A-D-D-I-E kind of a model. Um, and there's uh, almost every set of work has these, but again, sometimes they're informal and they're not formally documented, they're not formally defined. And so I've found over my four decades of doing this kind of work that I'm often helping my client define the process for the first time ever. People may have been doing it for decades, but they've never formally said, well, there's this first chunk of it, and then you do the second chunk, and this is what we're going to call it, and then we do the third chunk. And so that's that's makes it a challenge for us doing this work. So I'm going to Swip it, uh, flop this from a vertical orientation to a horizontal or orientation for the purposes of my next slides here. And I didn't want to throw you when I did that. So the upstream is on the left and downstream is moving towards the right. And we have inputs 
on the left, that's what these blue boxes are, various inputs, and they go into our process, which is sometimes called workflow, and it produces an output, which is an input. But I've added thought flow here. One of the major challenges for those of us in the instructional design or instructional systems design or learning experience design businesses is trying to figure out what's the thinking processes that go along with the workflow. So people think and do. They, they perform behavioral tasks that we can see, we can count, we can measure. But while they're doing those behavioral tasks, they're also doing cognitive tasks. And cognitive tasks are not overt, like the behavioral tasks that we can see, they're covert, they're hidden. We cannot see what people are thinking. We can ask people what they're thinking and they'll tell us, but, but normally, and there's reasons for this, they'll only be able to tell you 30% of what they're thinking. Most knowledge, the thinking behind doing is non-conscious. People have automated their thinking. And so when you talk to a subject matter expert or a master performer about what they're thinking as they're doing it, what the research shows is that they can tell you about 30% of what a novice needs. So if you're working with one subject matter expert to create training, that means you at best are going to give the, the trainee 30% of what they need. And they'll go from your formal training, they'll have to do informal learning afterwards and figure out what was missing. And so there's different methods. There's a method called cognitive task analysis, and I've got my own method for teasing out from multiple people, what is the thinking that's necessary to guide the doing of work? All right, we'll come back to that in a little bit later here. The next graphic here is much more complicated and I wanna spend some time on this. So one process leads to another process. Uh, this could be kind of at a macro level where analysis leads to design. We can also look at this more at a more micro level where I could be um, producing the first bot block there uh, process could be creating an interview guide. And the second block could be conducting interviews. So that's a more micro look at this. So this is scalable, this little graphic here to bigger processes or narrowing in on micro processes. We create an interview guide. Then we go conduct interviews. And if, the, if, if this is more micro here, so my output is an interview guide. That's an input to the interview that are conducted, which produce interview notes or recordings. So we can scale this framework here to our needs to determine what are people supposed to do on the job? What outputs are they going to produce? Again, we need to look at both their workflow, their behavioral tasks. What are the things that we can see that they need to do to produce that output? But what are they thinking as they do that workflow? So I call it the thought flow. I borrowed a term from a colleague that started using this, that thought flow term back in the late 80s and early 90s. So on the left, there's the, the blue arrows, those are inputs, and we can measure those. That's the code. M is for measure. We can measure them to make sure we're getting good inputs and that we should continue working with them in the process. But if we get bad inputs, we should stop and not you know, use bad inputs because we'll produce something that's inadequate. We can do our process and we can produce that output. We can measure it before we ship it to the next effort or we can, the next effort might be measuring it. If I'm creating an interview guide for you guys to use and go conduct a bunch of interviews, I can look at it myself to make sure that I think it's a good interview guide. And then I, it's my output becoming your input. And then you might measure it to determine, is this adequate to our needs? And so there's measures that we can place all over a process and they need to make sense because measurement is expensive and time consuming, but we need to make sure that the critical things are measured so that we can control our process, keep it in control to produce good things and not garbage. 
Now, so there's a bunch of other codes here. There's feedback. So we can get feedback from any point in this two-stage process and provide feedback all the way back to the first stage. In fact, we can go further back than the first stage with feedback. So we can gather data, feed that's feedback data, to affect how we're doing things. It might tell us, okay, that's a bad question. Number two question is no good. Um, and so I could update it and do better the next time. So I can get feedback from the system. But the system, the process orientation here can also provide consequences. They can be positive consequences and they can be negative consequences. At the very right there, where there's a measure of that final output, which is an input, consequences could be that I get a bad reputation back at box one, because somebody looks at that output as an input and says, the questions that the interviews, the data that the interviews generated is missing something. Well, that reflects more on the first box than the second box. The interview guide was inadequate and people used it and didn't generate all the data that was needed. So the consequence could be that I get a negative reputation or I lose my job. Or people say it was a great thing and guy gets a raise and a promotion because the person back in box one did such a good job that the people in box two also did a very good job but everybody recognizes it was the great questionnaire that was generated. So this is just a framework. And again, you may need to uh, adapt this rather than adopt it. You may need to change the language and labels in this to help it communicate this with the people that you're working with. But this is how we begin to look at workflow or processes and understand what are the tasks, the workflow behavioral tasks, the thought flow cognitive tasks that are necessary to produce an output, which is a worthy input downstream. So those measures, where do they come from? Again, they come from various stakeholders. And so the process itself has stakeholders and this is my framework. I wrote an article in the mid 90s that got published in one of the quality journals about this. And I wrote that article because my customer um, at a defense contractor in the United States, that my customer is running around saying, oh, the customer is king, the customer is king, the customer is king, we do whatever the customer requires. Yet I've been working in their organization for a number of years and I knew that that wasn't true. The customer, which was the either the United States Air Force or the United States Navy for this defense contractor had to abide by government regulations. In fact, they had gotten in trouble a couple of times because they had violated government regulations, even though a different part of the government was their customer. So I thought there, this whole notion of the customer's king is too simplistic. And so I said, well, so in my graphic here, the customers lead to the right, if you will, they lead the definition of requirements. However, they can be um, um, stopped from meeting, having their requirements met by management. Management could say, if we meet the customer's requirements, well, that's going to ruin all the other work that we're doing. So no, we're not going to meet that customer requirements. So the customer requirements don't dominate. You try to meet the customer's requirements, but there may be times and places when you don't. The executives or the board of directors or the shareholders might say, if we meet those customer requirements, we're going to go bankrupt. That's no good for our company. So no, we're not going to go do that. Let's hope our competition goes and meets those requirements and they'll go broke. And we won't, you know, then we'll have the market to ourselves. The government might say, because they have laws, regulations, and codes, that the customer requirements cannot be met because that violates the law. And in my uh, early in my article, I didn't include the society as a stakeholder in a hierarchy above the government. Governments, usually with the law of the lands that you operate in, they have the final say. But if governments are representative of the people, of the societies in democracies, then the government laws, regulatory codes, theoretically, reflect the needs and requirements of society. That's not always true, and that may be very idealistic, and we live in the real world. 
So we need to know if the society's needs and requirements re are reflected in the government regulations or not. Um, but this is part of, this is just a template to help understand who are the stakeholders? What requirements do they have? The employees underneath the customers, the customer may want something done that is a bit dangerous, unsafe. And the employees, their needs may be secondary to the needs of the customer. Now, hopefully there's government regulations for safety involved in all of that. But so the reality is, is that we'll often put employees at risk or ask them to work extra long hours to meet the needs of the customer. And it's an employee decision to continue in that job or not. Suppliers, on the other hand, they lag. We offload dangerous work to suppliers and let them worry about it. We offload to suppliers like temporary workers when we so we don't exhaust and burn out our employees. We can't have employees working 80-hour weeks, week after week after week after week. Eventually, we're going to have to bring in some suppliers, some temp help to help the employees meet the needs of the customer. And then at the bottom of my graphic is the community. Um, there may be community activists who are clamoring for certain changes in an enterprise. They may want more jobs for the local community rather than you know, sending jobs elsewhere. And so they have needs and requirements, but they usually don't supersede these other stakeholders. And the reason I put all of these stakeholders into a hierarchy is because I wanted to help my clients, the trainees that I was tr developing training for, understand when there's a conflict, when the customer says do X, but the government says don't do X, then what do you do? Well, I wanted them to be able to make a, a judgment here as to whose needs get met and whose needs don't get met. And that was the purpose of the hierarchy. Now, a word of warning. Uh, this example is for illustrative purposes only. There's many other stakeholders that might be involved too. And each one of these stakeholders themselves have stakeholders. And so it's quite a complex thing. And sometimes when you're dealing with complex performance, the stakeholder situation is quite complex and it's informal. You're not going to go someplace and find it all written down as to here's the requirements of all the stakeholders. Usually that's one of the things that we have to determine when we're doing our analysis for what is required of the process. If I'm going to train people to perform, what are their requirements? What are the do's and what are the don'ts by the stakeholders? And so that's what this model is for. Um, most of the time, every situation for a training project does not get this complex. This is just a model for the worst case scenario, if you will, but it's not something that's used all the time. Sometimes it's very simple. The customer requires this, management is okay with it, and there you go. So the customer requirements are approved by management and they concede and say, yes, let's do that. Uh, and if there's no regulatory issues, then you don't worry about it. Um, and this is why you, where you ask in your analysis efforts, who are the stakeholders? And if you're the people that you're working with, the subject matter experts that you're working with, the master performers that you're working with, you can use this template to, to ask them, are there government issues, regulatory issues, government departments that set the requirements? And yes or no is the answer. And, and then you go on from there. All right. The, this is the device that I've been using one way or another in one format or another since 1979, the performance model. This was called the performance table by Gary Rumler when I learned the derivative of a derivative of the Gary Rumler approach to performance analysis. And this is simply the, 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 the data capturing device. And I also include this in my analysis reports. So I capture the data using this device and I report it back out to my clients and stakeholders using this format. And at the top, it says area performance. That's one chunk of the performance. If we were looking at uh, instructional systems developer, a training development person, one area of their performance is analysis. 
Another area of performance that they have is design. So when we're talking about chunking that out, we would do a page or two or more for analysis. We would do a page or two or more for design. We would do a page or more for development, et cetera, depending on what framework you use. And here's where I capture what are the outputs required? What are the key outputs? You know, do I need an interview guide? And then I need interview notes. And then that's going to go into an analysis report. You know, what are the specific outputs? And what are the measures? What are the tasks? When we're producing an output, one output, what are the tasks associated with that? So when I do task analysis, I'm really doing output slash task analysis. So I'm not just looking at tasks without the outputs. I'm always organizing my task analysis data by output. And then I want to look at the roles and responsibilities. In the real world, usually there's more than one job performing tasks to produce an output. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in a moment. That's the ideal performance here. Outputs and measures that meet measures, key tasks, and who's doing what task. And then we can look at gap performance data. What are the typical performance gaps? What are the probable causes? And then we can attribute the probable cause to either a deficiency of the process, a deficiency of the environment, and then I've taken the human enablers and broken them out into two things. Because I'm coming at this to do training, I wanna know is there a deficiency of the knowledge and skills or is there a deficiency of the individual's attributes and values, those physical, psychological, and intellectual attributes? Because training can't fix those things. And the people's values, I might be able to change and shift some values, but if people are really biased against something and we need them not to be, I should probably go fix that by recruiting and selecting different people and trying to train them and fix that through training. That's my bias on this. So for every area of performance, I could identify one output. There may be more than one, but in my example here, I'm going to show you one output. I'm just going to use green boxes here. And for that, I might identify that there are three key measures. You know, cost and quantity and schedule might be the measures or something. Um, and then once I've got that clear and everybody that I'm working with agrees that, yes, that's the output. And yes, that's how the real world measures that. So we're clear on that. Then I want to identify, well, what are all the tasks that are performed per that one output? And so I would list all the tasks here. I'm not going to get into the details. I'll show you an example later. But so then I might decide, okay, so who's doing these tasks? <laughs> if I'm trying to train job role number one, I might find out that, well, they execute. See, there's a code down here. They execute that task. They execute this task. They execute this task, but then the fourth task, they support the uh, and provide input to this task, but they don't execute it. And these people execute, execute, and then you can see here's support, support, and here's the people with approve. So when I'm trying to understand out of all these tasks, is there a person who's assigned or a job title that's assigned to execute the task, perform the task? Uh, is there are there other people whose role is to support that task execution, but they're not responsible for it, but they are there to support people? Are there people who simply provide input and that's it? Are there other people who can review and provide feedback, but they don't get to approve or reject anything? Somebody else may get to approve and reject something. And over here, I've got this fourth role here. At that step there, they can approve or reject what's being done and force people to start all over again or go halfway up and redo some of these tasks um, because they have that role. And this could have been the individual contributor, the manager, the vice president, and the customer as one example. There are many different ways to look at that. And sometimes there's more than four roles. The worst case I ever had is when there was 27 different defined roles in a process. And so the column, the chart was uh, looked a little bit different because there was 27 of these columns here up in that. All right, so once I've pinned down what is ideal performance, I can begin to look at well, what are the typical performance gaps? Now, I get these gaps when I'm talking to 
groups. And when I'm generating this data, there's it's one of two ways. I'm either conducting individual interviews and reviewing documents and observing performance. That's the traditional way of doing this. The non-traditional way, when I started doing it this way in 1979, is to facilitate a group of experts, master performers is what I call them. They could be star performers, they could be exemplars, there's many different labels for a master performer, somebody who's doing the job currently at a level of mastery. And then there's other subject matter experts. I may be dealing with master performers and maybe I have a subject matter experts from regulatory affairs so they can represent what the regulations are to make sure that uh, the, the training reflects the regulations that are imposed on us. But I get these typical performance gaps by looking at the outputs. Is measure number one for this output, is that a typical problem? And it may be. In my example here, yes, it is. We have a problem meeting that first measure. We have a problem meeting the second measure. We have a problem meeting the third measure because we've got three performance gaps over here where we're not meeting these measures. Now, this is typical, not atypical. So it's not once in a blue moon, once every 47 years. It's like all the time. It's a typical gap. That's what I'm looking for when I'm doing training is what are the typical gaps? Because I've got to train people to avoid those typical gaps and their causes. So for each one of these typical gaps, I might be able to determine a cause or two or three for every gap. Here I've got them one to one. But sometimes there's more than one cause for a gap. And then I'm gathering the final piece of information is, so what are the cause types? If I've got this cause, is it a deficiency of the knowledge and skills? No, this first one is a deficiency of the environment, the codes down here. What I'm doing when I'm capturing this data is I'm trying to help the master performers and other subject matter experts I'm working with and my client who's going to see this data for them to begin to understand that training is not going to solve that first problem. It's a deficiency of the environment. We can tell people that there's a deficiency in the environment. We can train people that there's a deficiency in the environment, but the training is not going to fix the deficiency in the environment. The second one here is a DK, deficiency of knowledge and skills. The typical gap is caused by a deficiency of knowledge. We can deal with that with training or job aids, reference materials, resource materials, standard operating procedures, et cetera. We might be able to fix that with addressing the awareness, knowledge, and skills of the performers. But the first one, we're not going to be able to. This third one, a DP, a deficiency of the process, it may be that we miss this measure over here for that output because the process is faulty. And training is not going to fix a faulty process or a lack of adherence to the right, correct process. People might be taking shortcuts and they're not adhering to the process. And that's a deficiency of the process and management who is not managing their staff to adhere to the process. So that's this chart that I use to gather all of this. This is central. I said earlier that if my client had a swim lane process map, I might be able to use that. But the swim lane process map at best shows me the outputs and tasks and these roles and responsibilities. See, these are the swim lanes here turned sideways, if you will. But that what the swim lane process maps don't tell me, don't show me, there's no easy way to document it on a swim lane map, is this gap data. So this is the value add of a performance model over a process map, at least the way I've been using this uh, forever. Now, the swim lane map was popularized by this Gary Rumler character that I keep on mentioning. He uh, wrote a book in 1990. He'd been using the swim lane process maps. I have copies from 81 of, of work he did at Motorola. But he popularized that swim lane process map. But this performance model format came from Gary Rumler all, as well from the 1970s. So there's all that data. 
So these are my questions that I use when I'm trying to elicit that data one-on-one -on -one in an interview or when I'm observing something, these are the questions I'm trying to answer as I observe something. Or if I'm facilitating a, a group of master performers and other subject matter experts, these are the questions that I pose so that I can generate the answers and put them on that performance model chart. Now, I've been training people on these in this method here since 1983. My clients have seen us do work for them, and they said, oh, can you train our people to do that so we don't have to hire you? And my organization always said, yes, that's fine. We'll help you do that. Um, and so when I train people on asking these questions, I would tell them, these are my questions. When we do the exercises in the training session, you can't use my questions. You have to come up with alternatives. You need to learn how to paraphrase these questions. And I always did that because even when I ask these questions, if that does, question doesn't resonate with the person I'm asking or the team that I'm asking, I have to ask that question a slightly different way, something that will resonate with them that they'll go, oh, now we know what you mean. Sure. Okay. And then they give me the answer. But if I stayed stuck with these questions and didn't have a way to ask them in a varied manner, I wouldn't get the data I needed. So one of the things when I train people on this, and it's kind of my joke, that these are my questions, you can't use them, come up with some alternatives. Then later on, when you try to do this in your job, you'll have my questions and yours, and you will have learned how to ask guys questions in a slightly different manner. And because that I think is a key skill for an analyst is to figure out how to ask the question in a way that elicits the right data. If you ask a question and you get the wrong data, it's because of your question, not because of the other person. You failed to communicate what you were looking for. And so this is really critical. Um, I'm not going to go through these in, in great detail, but this is a, a tool and this is available in books that I've written and on my website and blog posts, et cetera, that uh, you can use. And you've got a handout copy here that I've shared with you. Um, so you can, again, Adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Guy's language may be totally inappropriate in your context. So you should adapt it rather than try to adopt it. And that's part of my message here is that I've been doing this my entire life. I've changed the things that I got from Gary Rumler back in the early 80s and in this 1979. And if I can do it, you can do it too. All right. So now I'm gonna shift, once we have the performance documented, we can figure out what are those enablers, those environmental enablers and the knowledge and, and, the, and the human enablers. So again, I'm you're normally doing this kind of work because my client wants some training. And I, but sometimes they wanted more than training. They wanted to know what are all the enablers. And so I, this is my knowledge and skill matrix. This is where I gather data for chunk A of the job, the link to area performance, A, B, C, D, E, and the graphic is a little screwy there, I'm sorry. But this is where I would list what are the laws and regulations and codes necessary for people to know about in order to do the job? What are the tools and equipment is a different category. So I have 17 categories on this, and I'm not going to go into, into those details. I'm going to, there's a hand, hand out a, a document that uh, I'm gonna refer you to later on that goes through all of those 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills. And we gather that data and we say, you need to know the first item here because it applies to A and, and D and F, but not the others. And so when we have learning content, training content on that one item, it's gotta address how to use it in those three areas of performance, not in general, not the history of it, but how to actually use that knowledge and skill in the performance and the tasks and upwards. And then we can gather other data about it. Do we select people who already know this? You know, if we're if we have to know AC, DC electrical theory and we're hiring degreed engineers, well, then we know they already know it. So we select for people who already know that thing. Yes, it's necessary to do the job, but we select people, we don't need to train them on it. So this is helps us understand what does the selection system bring to us in terms of enabling knowledge and skills? And then we can assess for every one of these knowledge and skill items that I have not listed here. Are they critical, high, medium, or low? 
Are they difficult to learn, high, medium, or low? Are they volatile? Do they change all the time or never, high, medium, or low? What depth should the training go to? We just need to give them some general awareness of that because of their prior knowledge. And so we don't need to teach them as if they've never heard of this before, or we need to give them deeper knowledge, or we actually need to give them a skill. Here are the codes down here for these sets of columns as I gather that kind of data. And that's the only kind of data I would produce if I'm doing a strictly training project. But I've had a few projects where my client wants to know more. So I have similar matrices for what are the attributes and values that are required to do the job? What are the data and information that's required to do the job? What are the materials and supplies? What are the tools and equipment? What are the facilities and grounds? What are the culture and consequences? So we can begin to understand using this fishbone diagram to enable that process, what are the knowledge and skills and what are these other environmental enablers and what are these attributes and values? So if we really needed to tease this all out for the client's purposes, we can. And there's a way to capture it and there's a way to report it out. And these are my matrices that I've used. I've been using these matrices uh, going back again uh, to the earth to 1979, a different version. They look slightly different um, because back in the day before computers, because 1979 was before computers for most of us, we put this on, we did typewriters. We had typewriters typing out these kinds of charts. So they looked a lot different. They didn't look as smooth and as pretty as uh, computers and dot matrix printers and then more advanced printers make this look. But so I've been collecting this data basically in these same formats for a long time. And this is input to my design process. The knowledge and skills data is input to my design process for instruction or training or learning. And the rest of these are if I have to re-engineer the process for my client's needs. Oh, and there's budget and headcount too. I almost forgot that one. Okay. Are there any more questions? or any questions to start? Okay, we actually have a few questions in the chat box. Um, I'm going to start with questions from our students. So the first question is from Fernard Indrana, and I'm not sure if it is a he or she. Um, how do we determine who are the most important stakeholders um, that we need to listen for the requirements? All right, that and so I put so uh, I put it into a hierarchy. So the people at the top win, and the people at the bottom lose, if you will. I hate to say it like that, but that's the truth. That's the reality of it. If the customers demand something, but the government says we'll fine your company, we'll throw the executives in jail, we'll throw everybody in jail, then you're not going to do that, even though the customer wants you to. So. The hierarchy, so you have to look at every situation though, because sometimes there are no requirements from the government, but the management, the owners of the company might say, if you do, if you meet the customer's requirements, we'll go bankrupt. And so they win. So, so the, the purpose of the hierarchy was to, to order them in the order of importance and who wins if there's a conflict. That was the intent of my article. That was the intent of the hierarchy. But you've got to be careful because just because Guy put this into that particular hierarchy doesn't mean that that's true in your situation. You would need to construct a similar hierarchy using mine as a starting point, perhaps. And maybe this, the order in the hierarchy is different in your case. You need to look at that. And, it, and as a training person, you're simply asking other people who actually know and they'll tell you and then you'll have you'll understand that so that you can train others if there's a conflict here's who wins or here are the typical conflicts maybe it doesn't happen every time but if there is a conflict here's the people the stakeholders here's the nature of that conflict and here's what you should do the government wins the customer loses that it's but that's the intent of that Okay, I hope that answers uh, your question, Fernard. If not, please feel free to uh, open your mic and ask more questions.
Okay. Okay. So we're going to continue with the second question from Sarah, who is also one of our students. Um, hello, Mr. Actually, it's Mr. Wallace. <laughs> I have one question. Um, many actress or actors works on company. For example, in Korea, we know there are companies like, okay, Hype Entertainment, like BTS. Okay, the references is very modern here, BTS. I hope, I hope you know uh, BTS. <laughs> or YG Entertainment, like Blackpink. How do their performance improvement work for actors or actresses? Okay, so I guess the question is how do you do performance improvement for, for actors, actresses? Is that the question, Sarah? Yeah, uh, yes, Mr. Hari. Okay. So the actor or actress is a performer and there's a director of the performance you know there's there's camera people there's audiences there's so these are the players of the performance so if the actor maybe they're not speaking loud enough i remember when i was uh, first got into business and one of the things that that it came naturally to me is there's this notion if you if you're going to make a presentation you have to speak to the back row you cannot speak to the front row and talk softly and then the people in the middle and the back of the auditorium can't hear you. You have to speak to the back row so that they can hear you. So you have to have the right volume. You have to project your voice, et cetera. Um, the same thing with, you know, if you raised your eyebrow in a scene, you need to raise it so people can see it. And if it's a camera, it's one thing. If it's a, a live uh, play, it's another thing. So, but it's the same notion. You've got to figure out, so what are the requirements of these actors? They need to memorize their scripts. Either they do or they don't. Uh, maybe we're asking them to memorize too much at any one time. Maybe we have cue cards that they're supposed to read, but the print is too small or the writing is unintelligible. So regardless of who the performer is, whether it's in a work setting or an entertainment setting, we're really focused on so what are their tasks? And then what do they need to know to do? And some people find it easy to memorize things like lines if they were in a, in a movie or a, in a play. Um, in a movie, you can have them do a second take and a third take and a fourth take. If you're doing a live stage production here, you cannot do that. You've got to have everything memorized. So you have to select actors that can actually memorize all of their lines. And so I think you can apply this to any performance situation um, in any kind of enterprise or company. We're always looking at what are people doing? What do they got to do that we can see? What do they got to think about as they're doing this? And what do they need to know? What kinds of you know, environmental supports, uh, stage props, et cetera, we need to look at all that, but if we're singular, singularly looking at the actor and actresses, we can apply this to them. What are their gaps from the ideal performance? Is it a selection issue or is it an issue we can train people on? Now you can train people to memorize more and more and more and more, but eventually they'll hit a limit. Some people can seem to memorize everything. They have photographic memories. And so you need to look at the situation and determine what the requirements are, and then determine what are the gaps and what can you do about it. Maybe you have the wrong actor in a role and you need a different actor who can memorize much more dialogue. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, do you have a follow-up question, Sarah? No, Mister. Uh, thank. Okay, thank you, Mister Wallace, for the for the answer. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I don't know how much time you want to set aside for these questions because I still have three more questions. Go ahead. Let's just do them. Okay. Um, the third question is also from one of our students, I believe, uh, from Muhammad. Uh, Mister Wallace, I want to ask for questions. In my point of view, EPPI model is often used in big companies to determine gaps in employee performance. And my question is, can I use EPPI model in small company or startup company 
that still doesn't have many employee or stakeholders? The answer is yes, you can use this in any size company. You can use this in a company of one person, um, an entrepreneur doing work uh, and help them figure out what their gaps are and what they might do to solve this. So it's a matter of the formality. Um, big companies might use this or most likely some other very variation on this um, in, in how they affect performance and processes, uh, depending on which organization they use. They could use uh, performance improvement people in a human resources organization, or they use engineers from the quality organization or some mix of those things. So I don't think the size of the company varies. I've done this with small departments on organizations, and it's a big company, but the whole company is not doing this, but basically one small department was doing this on one process. And so it, it's scalable. It can be used at any point here. Uh, part of the issue when you're dealing with smaller companies is you don't you try to be less formal about all of this. You can ask these questions and document things, but you don't have to make it look so formal because sometimes that scares people that it's too formal and we don't need all that. Well, you need the data. And whether you use Guy's performance model chart and, and, and capture the data and report it out that way, or you're write up the data a different way. That's the data you need to make the decisions to make the improvements. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, Pananta, our vice dean of academics. How do we <laughs> develop and measure thought flow and how do we make sure that the thought flow produce a maximum output? Yeah, thought flow is much more tricky. I wasn't going to go into details on that, but there's this approach. Uh, I, I learned a lot of, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and I understood the issue since the very beginning of my career. But I was not given the formal language for this until I was talking with a colleague of mine, Dr. Richard E. Clark, uh, oh. Dick Clark who's famous uh, in uh, instructional design circles um, for a lot of the work he's been doing. He's, he's a researcher. He worked at the, he's retired now from the University of Southern California. He's got a, several books out. He's written uh, dozens and dozens of research papers with other esteemed researchers in educational technology. And, and so he came up with this cognitive task analysis uh, approach. He's got a approach. There's many, many different cognitive task analysis approaches, but it's one of the ways to begin to elicit what is the thinking behind decision-making and non-decision-making performance? Um, and, and, but, that, but it's a tricky subject. And at the end of the presentation, I will reference a book that I wrote and published just this last July on my version of doing thought flow analysis. My intent is not to sell you books because I've got other free articles and blog posts on my website for it, but this is my full treatment of how to do that. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, and the last question is from me, actually. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, you only get 30% of what is needed uh, from master performer. So how do you fill the gap, the 70% the of data that's missing? Where do you get that from? Well, that, this is the nature of the cognitive task analysis. So let me uh, defer that until I get to the very end of the presentation. And since we're, we're short on time, this was supposed to be 90 minutes, correct? So we've got one minute left, I think. Oh, that's is fine. That okay, I'm if I go on fur uh, further, uh, longer, and this is being recorded, so you can watch this later on, but let me, let me kind of speed to the end here. The process, if it doesn't meet the requirements, it needs to be redesigned to do so. And so again, there's experts in process re-engineering. There's been books out on all of this going back into the, into the 70s and 80s. Um, but process re-engineering is a thing. It's a discipline. It depends on the nature of the process. Sometimes software engineers need to be involved or industrial engineers need to be involved. So it all depends on the process. If it's an HR process, HR professionals can usually revamp their own process. Maybe they need to work with information technology IT folks to help uh, automate parts of the process, et cetera. But again, you're always looking to meet the stakeholder requirements. So you have to figure out for the process that we have a problem with, 
and we need to fix that process, what are the stakeholder requirements? And then that's your guidelines for doing this, just like any other good engineering uh, 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 project would entail. So, so when you, so this next thing is, okay, I've got this framework on the right, the big blue boxes. When you have a gap in your environmental assets, and depending on what the gap is, if you have a gap, you have poor data, you have old uh, data that's not current being used and that causes problems. If you're already using financial data that's a year old, well, your prop, that's probably gonna affect your process negatively. So it's not the training for people, it's the data that they're given is bad. So you need to figure out who owns the data for that. Now, there are usually many sources for data. So it says information and data systems, the plural, suggesting that there's more than one source for data in most places for processes. The same thing with materials and supplies or tools and equipment. So I use this framework to ask my experts, the master performers, so if the data is bad, who owns that data? Where's it coming from? We have to go fix things there. We don't train people hoping we'll fix bad data. We got to go to the source of the data or whoever owns the data that's being given to the process and get that fixed. So this is just my framework. So what I tell people is that you have to go figure out for the situation you're looking at, for the gap that you're dealing with, who owns the responsibility for materials and supplies? Maybe not all the materials are bad, but maybe one source of materials. Do we go to purchasing? Do we go to some other place in the organization? Where are the materials and supplies coming from and how do we fix it? So you just use this to basically think about, I've got a gap that reflects this, these, this framework here, who owns it? And you're not gonna find many organizations, just because you have an information technology organization doesn't mean that the information comes from them. It be, could be coming from another HR department and IT has got nothing to do with it. So you use this as a, as a template to frame your deep, more further analysis that you would do. The same thing is true about the human assets. And this looks more like an HR organization over here. There may be a part of HR and some organizations have this, some don't. So I'm overgeneralizing when I said that, but some organizations have organization and job redesign systems. When they design a job, it simply doesn't evolve in some loose or sloppy manner. There's an organization in place sometimes that would actually redesign a job and take three jobs and make them two jobs or take two jobs and make them three jobs, depending on what the need was. And so sometimes there's formal ways to do this. This is usually the province of organizational uh, OD folks, organizational design, organizational development, that, that language has changed over the years too. Sometimes there's a staffing and selection where we're doing succession planning in organizations. You know, we're going to grow the organization. We're going to need more people to do sales. Where are we going to get them from? We're going to hire from the outside. We're going to bring them from inside. What are we going to do? How are we going to staff and, and do this succession planning? So there's sometimes in HR organizations, a group that does that. HR usually owns recruiting and selection, not always, but most of the time. Who owns training and development? That can vary too, but a lot of times you find it in, in the human resources organization. Who owns the performance appraisal and the performance management systems? Usually that's HR. Who owns compensation and benefits? Usually that's HR. Who owns reward and recognition systems? Usually that's HR. But not always. And so you got to be careful about that. You got to ask for the specific situation, who owns the, the source of the gap? So we're always being driven by the gap analysis. We've got to go figure out, so who owns that fix? Now, if I'm in a training project and I've uncovered all these gaps that have nothing to do with the knowledge and skills of the performer, you give them good data, they'll be just fine. You uh, recruit the right people, they'll be just fine. The training is fine as is. So if I help my clients see that, that spending any more time and effort money on training is not going to get them anywhere. It's a waste of resources. We need to actually go make the fix to where the root cause comes from. And that's what these blue boxes are really all about. You won't often find the organization named like the blue box, but sometimes you will or close to it, especially in this uh uh, the human enablers, uh, they usually are 
centered in the human resources organization. But again, not always. All right. Um, so there are many, many concepts, models, methods, tools, and techniques for dealing with performance improvement. There's things at the worker level, the individual contributors, the work level, the processes or workflows, the workplace level, you know, the entire organization, the function, the enterprise. There's things at the world level where we're dealing with value chains. One organization makes tires and they ship them to an automotive uh, manufacturer who makes the car and they ship them to dealers and there's this whole value chain. And so there's ways to do strategic uh, planning and strategic uh, alignment and operational balance scorecards. So this is an incomplete list, a partial list of all the of many different concepts, models, methods, tools, and techniques. And some of them appear in more of one of these four levels. So my point here is that over here on the left, build your awareness of the many tools available. You do not need to become masters of these tools and techniques, et cetera, but you should know generally what they do so that you can help your client because we're all about helping our client improve their performance. And if it, excuse my language, if it ain't training that's gonna fix it, that we help to guide them to where the appropriate uh, solutions are to deal with their issues, their problems, their opportunities, et cetera. All right, so I'm gonna come back to this slide here in a moment. I wanna to get to, there's, there's this article, this chapter 11 of the Handbook of Performance Technology. Here's a link to it. Um, it's on my website. Uh, um, it, this is really 25 pages of detail about what I've covered with you today. So you can go read that. You can review the video of, of this presentation. You can look at the slide deck that I've provided. And this was actually written up initially back in 1984 in the NSPI, which is now ISPI, in their Performance Improvement Journal. And it's an article that I was a co-author of with my two business partners. And so you, if you're interested, you can read back way back then. So we've been using this for a long time. I have a book from 1999. It won an ISPI award for uh, uh, outstanding communications. And I offer it as a free PDF. It's also available as a, as a, a, a paperback book and as a Kindle at Amazon, but I've, I've offered as a free PDF here uh, from 1999. And this is uh, consistent with how I look at training within the context of overall performance improvement. Training is just one subset, but this book reflects my performance orientation that I've covered with you today. There are hundreds of free resources on my website. Um, if you have questions or are looking for something specific, send me an email. I've written 17 books since 94. They're all about either training, instructional design, or learning experience design, and or performance improvement. And my last three books, uh, just a year ago and a couple of days ago, I wrote this conducting performance-based instructional analysis and doing that in every phase, not just in the analysis phase, to avoid uh, analysis paralysis. I have a book that came out in July on the three Ds of thought flow analysis. This is my approach to what is otherwise called cognitive task analysis. And then my uh, most recent book from September, just a couple months ago, is on lesson mapping. This is how I take all the analysis data and create a design that will then lead to development of performance-based instruction or learning experiences or whatever you want to call it. So this is more about these books. I'll scroll right through these things here. I was gonna talk a little bit more about what was in them. This is all about whether it's instruction, training, or non-instructional performance improvement. It's all about performance competence, which is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. To me, that's what it's all about. It's not all about training or learning, even in a learning organization, it's all about performance competence or whatever language is appropriate in that context. Thanks for your time today. Uh, follow up with me uh, individually if you wish or, or organize your questions and I'm happy to answer them. Um, and so the, the question that 
that I, I deferred was about this cognitive task analysis. And going back to the book on that, you'll see that I, 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 have, I break things into three things. I wanna know when performers are performing, before, during, and after they're doing a task or a set of tasks or steps, what are the discriminations they need to make? What are they looking for when they decide everything's okay or it's standard or it's not standard, the clients ask for something different, or I don't have the people or the tools that I normally have, I have to do some sort of a workaround. I need to discriminate what's different about this situation. So being situationally appropriate requires people to make discriminations about what's different this time. And you can use a different word than discriminations. That's sometimes problematic, but that's my language for this. So after I've made the discriminations of what, what's different this time, I've got to make some determinations about what are my alternatives. I could do A, or I could do B, or I could do C. Then I have to understand what are the pros and cons of my alternative A, B, and C. And then I've got to make a decision. What one am I going to go with? And if something happens, what will I then switch to? So I might decide that, okay, I'm gonna go with option C, that's my best alternative. But if such and such happens, I'm gonna switch immediately to B. I'm not gonna to go to A, I'm gonna to go to B. So my, my planned approach here, and again, this is I'm doing this cognitively, I'm thinking about this. This is how master performers look at a situation and go, hey, I've got three different options. I'm gonna go with three C, um, then if something goes wrong, I'm going to go to B, and as a last resort, I'll go with A, or I'll never go with A because that's not really a good alternative. So, so that's the thinking that we need to tease out from experts because they've automated 70% of their knowledge. Everybody, not just experts, you and me and everybody, have automated our thinking on most things that we can do. And if you ask us, we'll tell you something but it will be incomplete. And if our goal in training is to create content that is accurate, complete, and appropriate, accuracy is easy, appropriateness is easy, completeness is the main issue. Most of our instruction, unfortunately, is incomplete. That forces people to go from formal learning to informal learning or social learning because the formal learning was incomplete and not at everything that a novice typically needs to do the job. Any final questions? Okay, actually there is one question in the chat box from... Oh, two questions actually. Um, and one is from Jesslyn. Um, Hold on. I've been working in the entertainment company for nine months. Uh, we have constructed two trainings, but both of them weren't effective. We use Facebook diagram for service companies. After we sort out the problem, we find that the, the employees and the manager have a lack commitment of commitment to implement the training program. I understand that employees in entertainment are most practical people and don't like to face any difficult task. So the question is, is there any other method of training or any ways other than training that maybe will be effective for entertainment company? Um, all right, so yeah, there's, Sometimes the consequence system, uh, quite frankly, that might need to be re-engineered. If people don't want to do training and their performance suffers, well, then there's a decision management has to make. And it could be the managers are the problem, which means there's super, you know, managers, managers that have to be involved in this thing. Now, so I think that some of this is, revolves around transfer. We can create training and there, you know, there's the four levels or five levels of evaluation. So people can, you know, react to it. Oh, that was good training. And they can through the objectives, which hopefully the objectives were the correct ones. But sometimes it doesn't transfer then back to the job. And there's could be reasons for that. Maybe the training wasn't authentic. 
It didn't really prepare people. Like it. Yeah. Okay. And okay. The next question is from uh, Pak Wahyu. I'm wondering how you can apply the EPBI for a test that its success measures cannot be standardized in advance, but be determined by consumers, such as creative design works and artworks. Uh, yeah. So there's all right. So that. Um, Situationally, if you're creating a piece of artwork, you know, most of the time, I think an artist would say, I don't care what the marketplace wants or likes, I'm doing this for myself. And hopefully, you know, it resonates with some people. Maybe not everybody likes it. Maybe it'll provoke thinking. Maybe they'll hate it and that'll provoke thinking. And, you know, the whole world of art is, is uh, a different animal, if you will. Um, but, but for each um, application, for each set of performance, you can decide what are the probable measures. Now, sometimes the, the, the measure could be people like it or not. And you don't know what the answer is until you're done and they see the performance of a play and the play bombs or the play is a huge success. And in America, we'd say it goes from off Broadway to Broadway. It goes from the you know, smaller theaters to the big theaters and to larger audiences. And so we know that, that customer satisfaction is a critical measure. We do the work and then we find out, did we get customer satisfaction or were the customers dissatisfied? So the measure is something we can determine. It's the standard. Well, we want 80% of the customers to like it so that we can, we can say that and, and we may have data for that. But it's then when we actually put the product out or the service out that we find out that we didn't get it. Then we got to figure out well, what's the cause of the customer dissatisfaction and can we fix that? Is it because the people didn't have the right data or it was because they weren't trained properly? Maybe we were missing something in the training. So, so this is an iterative thing here. We, you know, uh, we can, we can pilot test, we can do uh, trials with products and services or plays. That's what going off Broadway in America is all about. You take a play off Broadway to a smaller theater and you see if the audience reacts the way you want them to. And then you take it to the big stage and, and to the bigger venues. Um, but, but so you can, I think, use this for just about every situation. Um, the success measures can be determined. It's whether or not you're going to meet them can't be determined until you actually do it. So when a car company comes out with a new car, they do market testing before they take it you know, to all the dealers and they get reactions to people early if you can do that. Um, so every situation is gonna be a little bit different, but I think you can take the same concepts and figure out how to apply them in this unique situation that I'm dealing with with my customer in their situation. One, I think you gotta always start with what's the, pro what's the output to be produced and what's the process to produce that? So, and then how would I measure the output and how would I measure the process? And you start with that and you think about stakeholders in terms of who are, who's measuring the output. Um, is it just downstream customers? Are there, is there other audiences that are measuring that output? And then what's the process that helps to guarantee that the output is a good one? So creative design works and artworks, I think there's, you know, so a lot of times people would say that some of the new cars that are coming out, they're very creative design and all of that. It's different than an than a art piece of artwork that's going to go on a museum or an art gallery's wall um, where there's only one of them. Um, but I think the same thing is that if you, you know, you either sell your artwork for millions and millions of dollars or it goes for 10 cents, you know, so it, it, it's hard, hard to do. But I think establishing measures you know, for an art gallery, the paintings on the wall, either the people that come to the art gallery like them or they don't or they hate them. So you can measure that reaction of an audience that way. And maybe the artist was intending to provoke people and to make them angry and that for them to hate it. Uh, I lived in Chicago uh, most of my life and uh, Chicago put up a Picasso sculpture, downtown Chicago. And the world hated it. All of the people in Chicago hated this artwork. 
Now, 20 years later, 40 years later, they love it. But they hated it initially because it was so avant-garde. And so I'm sure Picasso didn't care whether the people of Chicago loved it or hated it. He probably didn't care. He's an artist. He was he knew his worth and his value, and he wasn't going to let a, a immediate reaction change because people can you know gravitate and begin to like something over time. And so as an artist, you might learn that not not get so caught up in people's initial reactions, let them live with it for a while. Maybe they'll come around and then they'll like it and maybe eventually they'll love it. Sorry, I'm going so much longer over our 90 minutes, but uh, I'm happy to take additional questions and I'm happy to stay as long as uh, you would like. Okay, Pawahyu, do you have a follow-up question or did that answer your question? Thank you, that's all. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. There's no oh, follow-up okay. questions, thank you. It's quite okay. clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have like nine minutes left, and I would like to use this time to um, um, ask if you have any questions, uh, feel free to open up the mic and you can ask questions directly. Any more questions? No more questions. I was I was thinking about uh, the implementation of the EPPR in educational setting. Do you have any 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 example? Uh, university maybe or maybe like uh, uh, high school uh, setting that uh, you know uh, implement the EPPI uh, system. I just curious. I, uh... I, I do not, I, I have not worked uh, in general with the uh, public or private education sector. Most of my work is done with uh, uh, large and medium-sized companies. Um, although when I do work with large companies, it's not for the entire company, it's usually for a, a, a smaller, more targeted set of processes or department. But I think the same things apply. I would warn that you would want to change the language that I use because the language that I've got in my models and my methods are kind of geared for an enterprise, for manufacturing and merchandising companies. Yeah. Um, I've worked in every function in a modern enterprise, uh, uh, R&D laboratories, um, sales and, and service organizations and HR and finance and all of them. And, and I think this is generally applicable, but, but, and one of the things that I've learned is I go into a client organization and I, and they talk to me about the project and I begin to share with them, this is the data that I'm going to collect. Mm -hmm. Now, I often ask them, will this language resonate or will this turn people off? Oh, that sounds too corporate like, uh, well, that's fine. So what language should we use? So I begin adapting my own models and methods, especially the language, especially the imagery that I use, because I know that you know one size does not fit all. One graphic needs to be adapted so that it helps communicate, you know, either a message or communicates what I'm trying to gather. And so sometimes output is a word that some people are uncomfortable with because they don't really know what that means. Or I remember I've had a, a so, I, so I think that you, you need to adapt it if you're going to take this into the educational world, but I think it still applies. You know, students are the customers. Right. right? There's other stakeholders, like yeah. the government, like the parents, like the yeah. communities that they are going to be, you know, eventually leave the school and then go work for. So there's a whole set of stakeholders here. And what do they require? Now, in America, um, I happened to do a project with Motor when I was at Motorola where we discovered where I discovered for the organization that manufacturing supervisors could not read or write. They could read work orders in their workday, but they could not read training that was self-paced text. They couldn't read. And I pilot tested a course and they came back and said, well, my wife had to read this for me because most of them were males. And 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 I and I 
took that back to my clients and said, okay, I can't use this self-paced training. We're going to have to do classroom training because the people can't read. And they said, hold on here. This was early. Computers are coming to our factories. They're going to have to learn how to read. So they partnered with local community colleges in all of the sites where we had manufacturing facilities, there were 35 of them. And they had to partner with community colleges to create adult literacy programs to teach people to read because they had they couldn't accommodate the fact that people couldn't read well enough. They had to prepare their people for the coming of computers to the factory floor. So this is, this is where a partnership happened between a, a company like Motorola and their community colleges, because there's always a community college nearby a facility that just happened to be where a, a truism. And so they partnered with people to get them to read, but they could have, other companies in the town that I live now, where, I, where I'm semi-retired, the local companies here have partnered with their community colleges to teach certain things. Now, I happen to be in a town that used to be the furniture capital of the world, they would tell you. I, I didn't live here all my life. My wife did. And, uh, but, but so they have programs at the local community colleges on upholstering furniture, which is needed here. But, you know, three towns away, 100 miles away, they don't need that, but they need it here in this town. And so there's a way to partner with community colleges and then determine, do the community colleges or the university's processes, are they adequate to the needs? Who are the stakeholders? And so you always start with what are the outputs we produce? We produce students, we produce classes, we produce degrees, we produce... You know, and are these things meeting the needs of that of the stakeholder group? So that's where this all kind of comes together, where you're looking at who are the stakeholders? What do they need? What outputs do they need? What process will give them that? And, and you know, if there's limits in finances, so you can't do everything, you got to prioritize. Well, this is where stakeholders and their importance help you prioritize, you know, what you're going to do and what you're going to defer and what you might never do. Yes, there's a need for it, a demand for it, but it, it's, it's not big enough or sufficient enough to warrant putting your resources in on that. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, there are two things that I'm wishing right now. Uh, first, I wish there were more time, but it's, uh, we only have like two minutes to nine o'clock. <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap up. And the second thing that I'm wishing is that I wish you were in Indonesia with us right now, Mr. Wallace, so that I can pick you out for dinner or something. <laughs> but I, would, I would really like that. <laughs> yeah, but The let, pandemic let, will be over and it'll be possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let me express uh, my gratitude. Thank you very much for uh, spending time with us and... Um, delivering your presentation and explaining about the EPPI model. Um, from your presentation, I think we can conclude that this model works for all kinds of companies, big and small, and all kinds of uh, professions, including uh, artists and uh, PTS, as, as some of you mentioned. Um, I, and I think the, this, this area of performance analysis and performance improvement is something that we can uh, or learn. And I would like to invite you to encourage all of you to check uh, Mr. Wallace's website. Yep. Uh, you can find a lot of articles, links, uh, videos there, um, and you can still learn from Mr. Wallace from his website. And he also encouraged us to, you know, contact him through uh, his email, which is provided in the slides. You will notice that in the chat box, uh, Sela already sent the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint slides of Mr. Wallace's presentation. So feel free to download the slides. And again, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, send an email to Mr. Wallace.